vote for blacks and drive blacks back into back into submission to whites. Um, but but during that period, wasn't wasn't black progress? a part of what white people were concerned because you had most of your trains were pretty much in the hands of blacks because they they were the brick masons, they were the carpenters. Uh, they knew how to do more things than your, your run-of-the-mill white person. So there was a great deal of jealousy, I guess. But I want you to explain that period. Yeah, you know, uh, on those occupations like that, uh, when they were before they, before the whites started calling some of these things professions, uh, they were uh, service jobs. And uh, blacks could be conceived of as servants. Uh, but once they identify some of these jobs as professions, they began to deny the opportunity in those jobs to blacks. Uh, so that here at Tuskegee, uh, under Dr. Washington, Dr. Moten, uh, youngsters were being trained to be electricians, to be plumbers, to be brick masons, to be carpenters, you see, uh, to, 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 to do iron work, shoe horses, this sort of thing. Now, uh, when these blacks, if these blacks went into small communities in the South, they could not become electricians, they could become the helpers of electricians. The reason being that once they declared these to be professions and white people got interested in them, then you had to go through a licensing system, you know, uh, and you could not, if you were black, you were not going to get one of those licenses. Uh, I remember growing up in a town in South Carolina, Newberry, South Carolina, uh, and all of these years that had passed with black people being trained to do plumbing and all, you had never had a licensed plumber, in New a black licensed plumber in Newberry, South Carolina. But you had a man who had worked with a white plumber for some 25 years. Uh, and when he died, the man's wife couldn't sell the plumbing business to a white person. So she insisted that this black person take over the business. And she went before the licensing board and made them license this black man. He had, over, had some 25 years experience as a helper doing the plumbing, but he could not be licensed. So this is what some blacks ran into in these small towns. They could be the bricklayers and the carpenters to build the factories, but they could not be hired to operate the machinery as an operator. They wouldn't be paid like that. You had white women who operated the looms, but when they would take breaks, the black person who was the helper would operate the looms, in these textual plants. But it is not until uh, the 1930s that the pressure builds up uh, that we got to let some of these Negroes have these jobs because we are moving towards the end of the 30s. They were moving towards war, World War I, I mean World War II. Uh, and soon as they have no further need, they move these black women away from that. And it will require uh, the civil rights movement to get some of those blacks back at those, at those machines. What, what would you, how, how would you? But on the other hand, uh, Booker Washington trained meat cutters and the like here at Tuskegee, and they were good, and they were in great demand. So that the meat packers in the Chicago area uh, recruited uh, persons trained at Tuskegee and brought them into the Chicago area to work at the packing plants and all. Uh, and uh, they built a house, a dormitory, uh, for black meat cutters from Tuskegee. And they called it the Tuskegee House. That, that's what I'm trying to get a picture of. I'm trying yeah. to get a picture of the impact of Tuskegee uh. and the 
were oh, tremendous. No, that, no, that no. Dr. Washington and Dr. Carver really did. This impact. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, see, uh, well, uh, uh, you can take, let's take Dr. Washington. Uh, Dr. Washington uh, became interested, of course, uh, in education in the black belt of the state. Uh, and it's Dr. Washington who was a motivating force uh, for the, uh, uh, with Julian Rosenwald uh, that led to the establishment of a program for building uh, Rosenwald schools for blacks in the South. Dr. Washington bears a lot of responsibility and credit for getting him to do that program. Uh, Dr. Washington also uh, wanted to establish an ideal agricultural community near the school uh, out in the area uh, off of uh, uh, Franklin Road. It used to be called the Quarters where they had a lot of black folk. Uh, and uh, Dr. Washington uh, got money to start a project out there, land ownership and all. Uh, at one time in this county, there's a community on the Tallapoosa River called the Hornady Community, H-O-R-E-N-A-D-Y. And all of the land on the Tallapoosa River in the Hornady, in the Hornady Community was owned by blacks. Uh, and when I was in city government, uh, we wanted, the city wanted to build a water filtration plant uh, near the Tallapoosa River. And so we contacted uh, this black, the, the, the daughter of a black landowner out there. She had become the, uh, the guardian for her elderly parents. Uh, and when we contacted her to buy 10 acres of land, we discovered that she had mortgaged that land to a bank uh, in Montgomery. Uh, and some of us, helped her to save that land for blacks. Now, she may eventually have lost that land but uh, to whites, but at one point, all of the land on the Tallapoosa River in the Hornady community had been purchased under inspiration from Tuskegee and Dr. Washington. Mm. At land ownership, and you could meet blacks when I first came here, you'd meet blacks who were, were children who inherited land that Dr. Washington had encouraged their parents to buy. And you talk about education. Dr. Washington was single-handedly responsible for some of the schools being established by religious groups in the Black Belt urging them to come in. <coughs> there was a school that's over a hundred years old called the Calhoun School. Dr. Washington got two white women from the north to come to this rural county and then he went down with them and with the black people there chose the site of the buildings for this school. Now, there's a school in Selma, Alabama Concordia College. It is the coming together of Lutheran schools. <coughs> Excuse me. That was established in Black Belt, in Black Belt County. Now, the woman who starts the school came to Tuskegee to get Dr. Washington to provide her some funds so she could have a school to teach colored boys and girls. And he directed her to the Missouri Senate of the Lutheran Church. And they provided her some money to establish a little school called the Rosebud School. Uh, and beyond that, they added several other schools. And then they brought all of them together as a college, Concordia College, in Selma, Alabama. So Dr. Washington had an impact uh, on less than college education. Dr. Washington saw 
the need for trained black preachers. So with, the, with money from the Phelps sisters, he established the Phelps Bible School on the university campus. He saw the need for training midwives. And so at the John A. Andrew Hospital, women were brought in and trained as midwives. So the need for the hospital to become a regional service so that 11 or 12 counties around this school, around this hospital, John A. Andrew Hospital, uh, was a service area for the hospital. He saw a need for black doctors who were denied the membership in the American Medical Association uh, to have some continuing education. So he established uh, the Johnny Andrew Clinical Society annually uh, during his lifetime and afterwards. They were still doing it years ago when I came here. Uh, annually, you had clinical society meetings where they would bring in experts in various medical fields. And they would uh, bring in uh, charity patients do medical scans on them and the like. In fact, Dr. Charles Drew was on his way to a meeting of the clinical society when he had his wreck in Georgia and died from it. Wow. He was on his way to this meeting here at the clinical society. And it never would have happened, perhaps he wouldn't have been so tired if it had not been for the fact that he wanted to bring several of his students with him. Uh, and he got busy in all of this. Uh, and finally, when the students were free, they got into this car and they headed south to be here at the Clinical Society meeting. Yeah. Now, his daughter says that it's a mistake to say uh, that Drew died uh, because with all of the work that he had done in blood, that he was denied a blood transfusion that his injuries were so massive that a blood transfusion didn't work. And that's why he died. Can we talk about uh, George Washington Carver? Yeah, the peanut because man. The two yeah, the peanut man. George Washington Carver uh, had a choice, but he wanted to, when he was invited by Dr. Washington, he came, came here. Uh, he came here to head the Department of Agriculture uh, and an opportunity to do research. Uh, but uh, Dr. Carver had to raise his own money uh, to get a start here. He, Dr. Carver was an accomplished painter and an accomplished musician. So he, he gave concerts uh, to help raise money for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and Dr. Carver would get so busy uh, with his research uh, that he would fail to turn in his reports to Dr. Washington. And Dr. Washington would wrote him some criticism of his failures. Uh, but uh, another thing that Dr. Carr would get so caught up in, uh, he'd forget to, he would not cash his checks. Uh, and, he, and he confused the bookkeeper, you know, cause can't balance the book while you got these outstanding checks out there. Uh, he was uh, Dr. Carver, uh, I start to say stingy, but uh, frugal would <laughs> be a better word to say. Uh, frugal, he's very frugal. Yeah, and so uh, when he died, uh, he left uh, to the university over $33,000. And that was used as a basis to start the Carver Research Foundation which still operates on campus. Yeah. Now, Dr. Carver invented so many things, but somebody told me that he invented uh, rubber also, from that he made rubber from, with, which was yeah. used to put tires <coughs> and vehicles in World War II that the government uh, That uh, That may be exaggerated. Uh, Dr. Carver was experimenting with the various products uh, that you could make from peanut and sweet potatoes. Uh, and he was able to do 
sweet potato flour and all these various other things, several hundred of them, uh, products in fact. Uh, he made a lot of cosmetics, uh, produced a lot of different cosmetics, a lot of flavorings, uh, some paints, and, uh, animal feed, and all of that. Uh, he, he, did, he did remarkable work, uh, but uh, he left most of it in the public domain which means that neither he uh, nor Tuskegee uh, made any money off it. Uh, at best, uh, Dr. Carver, uh, there are three patterns perhaps at best, uh, not more than three patterns uh, in the cosmetics arena. Uh, and uh, Dr. Curtis, uh, who worked with him, did establish a little manufacturing in Chicago uh, to produce some cosmetics that Dr. Washington had come up with. Uh, and we continue some of that research uh, with sweet potatoes, for example. <coughs> Tuskegee uh, has, uh, has had an experiment with sweet potatoes in space, uh, had a project with NASA uh, for growing sweet potatoes in a circulating liquid. Uh, uh, and of course, when the application was made, uh, NASA had it reviewed by some other scientists at other institutions who declared that it couldn't be done, could not grow a root crop in a circulating liquid uh, solution. Uh, but uh, Tuskegee proved that you could. Uh, Tuskegee has a pattern not for the hydroponic process for producing sweet potatoes, but a pattern for the growth plate on which you produce the sweet potatoes in the circulating liquid. And the reason it doesn't have a pattern for a root crop was that uh, they were already producing sugar beets hydroponically in Northwestern Europe. But what Tuskegee has uh, is the pattern for the growth plate. Uh, and and it, it, it's most, it was the most interesting process. I watched it develop. Uh, the first couple of years, you, you had these roots, and they smelled like sweet potatoes, okay? Uh, but they were roots. But then, eventually, you started getting those sweet potatoes. They did produce the sweet potato. Uh, NASA got interested because of the space station and the possibility for growing sweet potatoes in space. Uh, a, a, uh, another benefit, a derivative benefit, uh, is that uh, the sweet potato is so rich in nutritive value uh, that uh, you can, and it grows so easily in tropical regions that uh, it would be good for third world countries. You know, sweet potato as a tropical product, we talk about uh, African yams. I was in Africa uh, in Togo. Uh, and I was surprised to see what they call a yam. Uh, it smells kind of sweet potatoish, uh, but it has a thick hull, a thick skin on it, and it grows bigger, generally bigger. Uh, uh, and in the West Indies, they call these little things, and they're so sweet and good, they call them yams, you know. So I don't know. Uh, maybe there are different varieties of the yam because we we call them we just call them sweet potatoes. They're either, either small sweet potatoes or they're big sweet potatoes, you know. Uh, but some people call them yams. And, you know. But uh, Dr. Washington certainly uh, had uh, these products. Uh, Henry Ford uh, encouraged Dr. Carver uh, to uh, to do some research on on the soybeans. Uh, but uh, Dr. Carver had his own research uh, outline and was not interested in going to work for, uh, for Ford. Uh, but um, Percy Julian, uh, out of Montgomery, was born in Montgomery, Alabama, attended the, uh, the uh, school over there as a youngster, the, the, the school at Montgomery, Alabama State. Not the college, but the little school. 
got involved with the soybean. He, he's black, Percy He's Julian. black, Percy Julian's black. And Percy Julian uh, became an early black millionaire mm -hmm. over what he did with the soybean and the calabar bean. Calabar bean out of West Africa and a soybean. Uh, and from the soybean, uh, he produced uh, physostigmine, uh, which is used to treat glaucoma. Physostigmine was developed by uh, Percy Julian, P-H-Y-S-O-S-T-I-G-M-A-N-E, physostigmine. It's in medications used to treat, yeah, that's right. And uh, he also uh, developed uh, Aeroform, which is used to fight high intensity fires, including spraying on runways when planes have to land without a landing gear and the friction could cause a fire. And uh, he developed uh, various kinds of, uh, uh, various kinds of uh, treatment, uh, testosterone, combinations like that. Oh. Yeah, Percy Julian. And after he developed all of these products, out there, he had a lab outside Chicago. He sold it to a major company uh, for about two and a half million dollars. He had so many different products there that the company then hired him to operate. So he became a multimillionaire. Percy Julian became a multimillionaire, leaving a multimillion dollar estate uh, and George Washington Carver de developed far more products uh, and died leaving some $33,000 behind. But Carver uh, gave God credit. He tells this story that he asked God uh, to, uh, to, uh, to alert his mind and all. He wanted to explore the mysteries of the universe. And he says God told him that his puny mind couldn't deal with that, that he ought to study the peanut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let me ask you, can you give me 20 more minutes? Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Cobb is credited for saving agriculture in the South. He did. Can you expand on yeah, that? Uh, what was killing southern agriculture was, uh, was cotton. The cotton depletes the nutrients of the soil. Uh, and this intensive cultivation of cotton. Uh, and then came the boll weevil. And the boll weevil was very destructive of cotton. So that Carver uh, knew how to build soil up uh, with different kinds of uh, legumes. Uh, and so the peanut, he urged people, urged the farmers to plant peanuts. And then they want to know, where is their market? So he then decides that he must create a market for peanuts. And this is how he goes intensely uh, into experimentation with peanuts and with sweet potatoes. He has to produce a market. Uh, he. Uh, during World War, uh, World War I, uh, when it appeared that you might have uh, a shortage of the grain crops from which to make bread, uh, Dr. Carver produced flour from the sweet potato. And you can still buy sweet potato flour. Uh, Is it nutritious? Uh, yeah. Uh, here at Tuskegee, when we have the uh, uh, the sweet potato festival, I'm mean, have the Carver Festival. Uh, you have different products uh, that uh, you've done here on campus, uh, and they bring them out as samples. We've had sweet potato ice cream, uh, sweet potato biscuits, sweet potato cake, sweet potato casseroles. You can use the leaves of the sweet potato, you know, that's as a vegetable. Uh, but slaves knew this. Uh, slaves uh, ate various things that the whites did not eat 
uh, like uh, the tender leaves of sweet potato plant. Uh, I've tasted them. Yeah, they just they about as good as spinach. But I don't know if that's saying much, but it's it's as a vegetable. Uh, and what the slaves didn't know, they didn't know about any kind of nutritional value. So what we do at Tuskegee. Uh, is that uh, we derive, uh, you know, these formulas on nutritional values and all of that. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, at that period, we have meatless casseroles, and, uh, well, vegetarian casseroles, and casseroles that you can add some meat to, all sweet potato based, you know. Yeah, very you, good. You, you've been talking about uh, inventions of just two people uh, that blacks have contributed to the oh, overall man. development of America. Oh, but if no. you look at the inventions of African people across okay. the board, how would you describe uh, that? How would you, you, could not, you could not have had the significant development uh, of the post-Civil War Industrial Revolution uh, without blacks. Without blacks like Frederick uh, Frederick McKinley Jones, uh, Granville T. Woods. See, uh, uh, Frederick McKinley Jones was was an, an electromechanical genius. Uh, Garrett Morgan, with the gas mask and the traffic signal. Uh, but Garrett Morgan did something else. Uh, Garrett Morgan uh, operated the tailor shop, uh, and he. Uh, wanted some way, some solution to protect the, the needles, coating on the needles, so that you didn't, ru that you didn't ruin uh, delicate fabrics. And he was experimenting with the solution, uh, and his wife called him to dinner, uh, and he left his solution in a bucket, uh, and a dog knocked it over. Uh, and when he returned, uh, and saw that it had been spilled and all, he noticed something else. Where it is spilled on the dog, it straightened the dog's hair. <laughs> so so, so that Garrett Morgan <coughs> had discovered a hair pomade to straighten hair, black folks' hair. Uh, and, and so he went into that, he went into that business. He, he started manufacturing it. He was operating the tailor shop, now he's doing uh, a hair preparation, and he he precedes uh, uh, in the preparation of it, he precedes folk like Madam C. J. Walker and Madam uh, Tombo Malone, uh, black women you know who go in for it. Yeah, uh, but yeah, indeed. Uh, 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 let's see, uh, Fred McKinley Jones. Uh, built the first refrigerated unit for a truck. Uh, and he built a ticket dispensing machine. He built, uh, uh, he developed uh, uh, lighting. He was concerned about theater lighting and all. Uh, and so he developed a lighting system for theaters. Yeah. But many people give uh, Edison So, uh, uh, incidentally, uh, when the Paris Exposition was held at the turn of the 20th century, they wanted to honor a black inventor who had left the United States. He was trained in France. He came back to the United States. And because of racism in Louisiana over a project that he had, uh, that he left uh, and went to Paris where he became the headmaster of the school from which he had graduated, and then went on to become a specialist in Egyptology. Uh, he is the man, Norbert Rilou, who developed the multiple evaporation process for refining sugar, cane juice into sugar. Uh, and so the French wanted to honor him, and so they sought information about other black inventors from the U.S. Patent Office. The U.S. Patent Office had a couple of inventions attributed to blacks. Henry Blair, a seed planter, an improved seed planter. 
they had not identified inventions by race because they figured they're all done by white folk. Uh, so they wanted to know from black colleges, black newspapers and the like, identify some black inventors. And when they got through counting them up, they had over a thousand patterns that had been issued to black folk. Uh, uh, Jones, for example, had some 60 patterns. McCoy, the real McCoy, Elijah McCoy, had all of his patterns basically uh, in lubrication systems. Oil lubrication with a lubricator cup to, to end downtime so that you don't have to have the engine down in order to lubricate it. Uh, and uh, graphite lubricators. Both types of lubrications are, are, were patented uh, devices for doing it. Patented by Elijah McCoy. When yeah. it comes to the electric light and the telephone, do we have any real... Yeah, uh, uh, you had uh, Louis Latimer uh, did the improved filament in the light bulb. He has a pattern for that, or had, you know, improved filament for light bulb. His experimentation was on increasing the lifespan of the electric light bulb. Edison's and he also, by the way, he also uh, did the drafting uh, of the uh, designs for Bell's telephone. He drafted those pictures for submission to U.S. Patent Office. You had a field uh, of uh, patent illustrators, uh, and, and Louis Latimer taught himself the trade of patent illustrators. The, the reason why I was asking that is that we started out talking about the contributions of Africans to, a, to the development of America, even though we were looking at, at Africans as slaves, mm -hmm. just still building in infrastructure, clearing the land, and, and, and being the basis for its economy. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the infrastructure of America, its mechanical uh, and engineering, you still find there the same kind of contribution and input. So, uh, and I want to leave that period, but I'd like you just to kind of summarize. Uh, if you look at communications, if you look at uh, um, transportation, oh, yeah. if you look at uh, government itself, the laying mm -hmm. out of Washington, uh, yeah. if you look at uh, uh, military, if you look at any phase, of American yeah. progress and structure, you find that the African is key to that. Not like mm -hmm. you. Yeah, you know, you, you touched on that. Uh, I, I intended to go in that direction when I said the impact uh, after the Civil War and in second stage of the Industrial Revolution in this country. But the main areas that you're going to have are going to be in transportation, communication, refrigeration, and blacks were important to all of these fields. You see, um, uh, Granville T. Woods, Frederick McKendry Jones, Garrett Morgan, Louis Latimer, these people made significant contributions to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you see, when we talk about uh, Frederick McKendry Jones, and his work in refrigeration, uh, it makes possible uh, refrigerated units on planes, on ships, on trucks. You see, the first refrigeration unit uh, that was built by him was put underneath the truck, uh, and it got clogged up by rutted roads and the like. And so he then mounted it on top of the truck, and that's where the efficiency is. You will see some uh, vehicles with the air conditioning unit mounted on the top. And, and, and this, is, this is what he experimented with 
uh, and this is what makes possible bringing uh, food in on refrigerated ships, you know. Uh, it it uh, also made possible uh, refrigerated blood for blood transfusions and all. Work with Charles Drew for refrigerating blood uh, as blue as uh, Drew worked on to go into plasma, which does not require refrigeration, does not require typing. See, with whole blood, you got to type it A B A B O. See, with plasma, you don't have to type it. And the idea that Drew had. Uh, was the possibility of artificial blood. Uh, and there have been experiments done with artificial blood. Uh, Drew was ahead of his time and unfortunately uh, died too young. You know, some of these things that happen. Uh, but uh, in organ transplantation, in black folk especially, Kidney transplants, organ, those sorts of organ transplants. Yes, kidney transplants. Sure did. I, I didn't know blacks pioneered. Pioneered in kidney transplants. Oh, uh, mm, name slipped out of my mind, but it sure was. Perform, performed uh, over 500 kidney transplants experimented with drugs to reduce organ rejection. Sure. And developed a test uh, for syphilis, for detecting syphilis. Mm -hmm. Invented invented the golf tee. Tiger is not out of his league. That, uh, they, the, the, the golf tee was invented by a black person. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let, let me Pen ask. The pencil sharpener, the bicycle frame, the self player piano, these were all done by blacks. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just have a, a, a few more questions, actually. And that is a concern that I have mm. for where we are now as mm. black people. Um, if you look at that period from 1865 to uh, 1935 years, and you look at the progress that black people made, it was really, uh, I, I, I've heard people say that the progress that black folk made in those 35 years cannot be compared to any other group in America terms of coming out of slavery uh, at that one or two percent literacy rate in 35 years so 50 percent of its population mm -hmm. uh, was literate uh, the land acquisition from nothing to mm -hmm. over 16 million acres of land mm -hmm. uh, with all that they had arrayed against them um, inventions and uh, every just in every dimension mm -hmm. of progress. Uh, but there was a backlash, and the backlash really started before. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Rosewood, and you had uh, mm -hmm. uh, Black Wall Street, you had the Klans, and you had everything just to try to put the black man back into a severe servitude position. But, but you see, you had these things existing side by side. It depend, depend, depended upon what area you were involved in. See, uh, just as you cannot uh, take slavery and fit it into one package uh, because there's going to be variation uh, in the institution of slavery from one state to another, sometimes even within the state. Uh, well, for example, there were laws which prohibited uh, the teaching of a slave, how to read and write. Uh, but you had some masters who did allow slaves, faithful slaves, whom they were going to use for their purposes to learn how to read and write. The most trusted bookkeeper for a plantation was a slave bookkeeper. 
because he wasn't going to cook the books. He was going to be very loyal because his position uh, elevated above all other blacks on the plantation was based upon his loyalty and his honesty in, in, in dealing with these things. And he knew that the slave knew if he tried to steal from the white man by cooking the books or something, uh, he'd get caught, you know. But a white man would try it, you know, because he could get, he figured, I can get away, I can steal it, I can get away. Where was the slave going to go if he, if he stole from the man? He's trustworthy. Uh, you had a white man in South Carolina who eventually owned uh, uh, several large plantations, and each one of them was managed by a slave. Each one. Because he could trust them. Uh, one of the biggest importers on the Mississippi River uh, before the Civil War was a slave. And his master permitted him to do it. He made money for both of them. He imported fine clothes from Paris and all, and the ladies, the white ladies, bought from his emporium. And the master permitted him to bring a tutor in to tutor his sons, the black man's sons, and sent their white sons to the same tutor right there in Mississippi. And he could have bought his freedom, but being a slave was a protection for him from other white people. We just talked about lynching here. The increase in the lynching is going to, the, the lynching is going to become a phenomenon used against blacks in the South after blacks are free. As long as blacks were owned by whites, whites had a reason to protect their economic investment. But when blacks reach a stage where they can declare themselves to be the equal of the white man, the white man finds ways then to kill him and kill them all. So, so you have this this ambivalence here. It's just like Dr. King says, is that uh, black people live on tiptoes because you don't know at which point uh, it would be tilted against you. You know? There were slaves who got away with things on the plantation, talking to the master and all. But then the slave because he's a clown for the man. But then the slave knew when the master had a bad day and that he wasn't in for joking and clowning. So you back off. See? So that, so I can't, you know, when, when you're rearing kids, kids know at how far they can go, you know? Your attitude, the sound of your voice and all, you know, slaves, slaves, but slaves knew. They knew the point at which uh, they might get whipped for almost anything. Uh, and, and in freedom, black people adjust. See, slaves survived. Think about this. Slaves, black people survived because they were protected as property. Native Americans resisted the white man and the white man practically wiped them out. But his diseases didn't kill, his bullets killed. And he took the land. He marched resolutely from one ocean to the other, taking the Native Americans' land. Okay? And now Native Americans are getting back because they're getting, they're getting paid. The black folk want to get back for their labor. Uh, you got some black folk who say that uh, they don't deserve it because they're not the ones who were the slaves. 
But what they ignore uh, is that some of these greatest states were built on the backs of slaves, and they are still in the hands of slaves. I mean, it's still in the hands of the descendants of those people, or the descendants sold them to somebody else and pocketed the money and went in, went in another direction. You see, uh, when you, next time you look at Katie Curry, uh, Katie Curry's grandfather dealt in slaves in New Fallen, Alabama. Katie Couric on the Today Show. She's the co-host of the Today Show. She got slave owners. She's in, out of Virginia. She had slave-owning relatives. That's right. Well, that is what the backdrop to the question I wanted to ask yeah. you. Okay. Um, because, as you say, when Africans were slaves, they were mm. somewhat protected. And during that Progress. Uh, yeah. White folk turned against them. They were, they were resistant. Now, they resisted. Uh, and 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 blacks were sitting back for a hundred years. It wasn't until, as you pointed out, 18, uh, 1965 that the civil rights, uh, voter rights movement uh, legislation was passed. Yeah. Now it's been thirty-five years from from nineteen either, either either way, huh? Two thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Now, are, are you concerned when you look around and you see the same things happening, but perhaps in a more subtle way, but mm -hmm. over a million and a half black men in prison? Uh, yeah. There are ways to pick up yes. and there's That's AIDS, right. there's everything mm -hmm. to wipe us out. It's the same. And, and some of it, though, is our own self destructive behavior. You see, we uh, that uh, it did appear. Uh, and, and true to a great degree, is th with all of the violence of the last uh, 35, uh, nearly 35 years of the 19th century, all of that violence against blacks threatened the, the existence of blacks. But this is what happens, you see, when when the federal troops are withdrawn after the Compromise of 77, 1877, Southerners declared that they were going to recognize or honor the rights of United States citizens. But they didn't consider blacks to be in that category. So they start out by depriving blacks in the South of their right to vote. This leaves blacks defenseless in a political system that is controlled by whites. And once whites don't have to rely upon any black support, then the whites proceed in their legislative branches with the enactment of more and more Jim Crow laws so that they take away the right to vote, and then they eventually threaten the right of black people uh, to exist. They will not admit blacks to hospitals so that blacks face death from diseases. They won't put in sanitary sewers uh, uh, in small black communities. They won't put in paved streets so that the streets in the black neighborhood in the South will become dust bowls in the summer, quagmires of mud in the winter. You get sick, no hospital, you see. There's an incident that happened uh, following my first year at Tuskegee uh, when four of my students of that year uh, went to New England to work and they decided to save money to come back to Tuskegee by buying a used car and driving back and the driver fell asleep 
in the mountains in Tennessee. And all of them died. They didn't all have to die. But the call that went in for an emergency ambulance did not identify them as black. It should have gone to the undertaker whose ambulance was used to transport blacks. The ambulance of white folk was for white folk only. So when the ambulance got there, for white folk, it did not pick them up. They had to call for the undertaker's ambulance. Come and get them. And in the meantime, that's what they needed, an undertaker. You see, segregation had killed them. The segregation had denied them rights in the South. And now segregation had killed them. That's the danger. That was the danger. You know? That a segregated system. It denied, it denied all of the full use of talents. Uh, you think about Dr. King. <clears throat> what would Dr. King have been able to accomplish as a scholar? if he had not used his scholarship in a struggle for freedom. How many books would he have written that were scholarly books? He wrote books, uh, but he wrote books of sermons and sermonettes. He didn't delve into any deep philosophical questions, and yet they said he was capable of doing it. How much energy has gone into a struggle for rights? Uh, back in 1990, I guess it was, in the 1990s, uh, a film crew came in to interview me uh, for a Christian radio, a Christian TV program. And they never put on the air, they put the interview on the air, but they never put my concluding statement that was, was a response to. He wanted to know from me, what did I see uh, for this country uh, in the 2090s, 100 years from now? I said, in the 1890s, W.E.B. Du Bois said that the race problem was going to be the problem, the challenge of the 20th century. And here we are in the 1990s, and we still face racism, that unless we can do something to resolve it, it will be the problem still in the 2090s. See, and it's a problem uh, that black people can do something about but they can't completely resolve it. And they can't resolve it because white people control the power structure. You ever think about this? That when we protest on the denial of rights, we protest to a white power structure. When we appeal for our rights as Americans, we appeal to a white dominated power structure. So that by making appeals to the structure, we give the white people this inordinate, expre inordinate belief that they are in control. Now, I don't have an answer. I don't know what else we could do. But the fact that we have to go to them solidifies their position that we hold a superior position in this society. You know? But I don't have the answer otherwise. I know that what we do gives them this impression of that inordinate power and control over us and over women. Okay? 
the white male power structure, the good old white boys. Let me throw this out to you as a concluding question. And that is, uh, I get us a lot of thought and I just want you to respond mm -hmm. to whether you think this is a possibility. Mm -hmm. Linwood and I have been traveling all over the South doing these series. Mm -hmm. We have seen large tracts of land, Alabama, mm -hmm. Georgia, Mississippi, uh, mm -hmm. all around. And I just wondered in my head what would happen if black folk moved back in these areas and began to buy land and produce uh, foods and clothes, be become producers. Mm -hmm. And we somehow begin to buy from one another and circulate that. Mm -hmm. Ten billion dollars that we accrue a year mm -hmm. among ourselves. Would white people react in a way that would uh, kill us anyway? I mean, and then we can't worry about that. I think mm -hmm. we don't have a choice but to make a decision. But we would still talk. run in, though. We would still run into. Well, you have to live whites, who, whites who control uh, the wherewithal in the economic system. Uh, they own they own most of the banks. Uh, when when blacks get dealerships, where do they go to get the money? You know, whose dealerships do we get? We, we've got uh, uh, and and some of these. Uh, dealers, that, uh, some of these corporations that used to discriminate against us uh, finally discovered that the color of money for everybody is green. And so uh, they would let us have franchises. You know? And some of those very same companies used to discriminate against us rather rigidly. Uh, and we end up with that, uh, their, their uh, leases and their contracts and all. Uh, we don't produce any automobiles and yet we love good cars. Uh, it's not easy to do it. We are easy to do and go in an area like that. We had, uh, here in Tuskegee, we had a man out of New Jersey uh, that was claiming he was going to put an oil refinery. We let him, the city let him have land out there. He called himself cutting the timber to clear it for a refinery. Cut the timber and sold it. Never put a refinery out White there. Man. Black, black man. But then I told them to begin with that you study a situation. He had a two million dollar line of credit. You don't build an oil refinery with a $2 million line of credit. You don't bring oil, crude oil, from Mobile, from Venezuela, or anywhere else. You don't bring crude oil over 200 miles to a refinery in Macon County. Because you can't sell any of that. That's crude. You, if you're going to have a refinery, and you try to pull it, put it close to your source so that when you pipe the oil, you're piping a product that you can tap into and sell, you know. Uh, and I knew this. See, the water that you use here comes from the Tallapoosa River. My name is on the building out there, and the cornerstone of the building is the chairman of that committee. We got that money and built that filtration plant. But we wanted a, a, a processing plant on the river because we wanted to sell that water to communities all the way from the Tallapoosa River into Tuskegee. And we did. We, we made the water portable at the river, at the filtration plant, and then in communities and built up areas along the way we put in those pressure units and we sell them water. The city sells them water. See? Now, if we brought raw water 
all the way in, you couldn't sell it. You got a process to do it. Oh, uh, and, and, and we're not really, we don't hang with farming much anymore, <laughs> you know. Uh, we won't, you know, my, my, my wife's uh, grandfather had a few thousand acres of land that he divided among his children at all. Man, all those kids practically going up to Detroit and places like that. Uh, and, and that land is now in the hands of white folk, you know. Uh, and white folk, uh, white folk let that stuff grow up into timber and harvest it every 20, 25 years, you know, because timber land is taxed on a different basis uh, in Alabama. Yeah. And so pasture lands have become forest lands, you know. We own a little land out uh, on, on Highway 80 there that was, that was her parents' land. Uh, and we don't farm a thing out there. Trees. We haven't farmed anything out there. We never farmed anything out there, you know. But trees. We cut the timber down, sell that, you know. But that's about the way that thing is. There used to be farms all in that area. Man, there's not a single farm in that area, not a number of trees. <laughs> trees. But do we have, what, 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 yeah. then, then what is our salvation? Uh, I, think, uh, I think that uh, integration uh, into an economic system uh, that's a viable economic system, uh, we don't partnership well. We don't incorporate well. Uh, we, we go the individual route so that our stores become little mama papa stores. You know, our filling stations, they're not, uh, not massive the operation. We had a young man here, uh, grew up in this community, educated in Tuskegee and all. Uh, and so we were all proud uh, when he built this first-rate filling station out here on Highway 80, it's now a shell station. But he tried to work a job and operate a business through people hired at probably minimum wages. And so he lost the business. He lost the business. See because uh, the mama-papa arrangement, they don't let anybody handle that cash register for somebody in the family. But we have had two Walmart stores here. We had a Walmart, and they moved out. They gave us a bud. It moved out. We got a shopping center down there with a centerpiece that has been empty for years because they moved out. Russell, well, it was, it's called Ford Crossing Shopping Center. Uh, but they, they charged that. And the clerks were stealing, before, that people were stealing the goods before it ever got inventoried into the store, taking it off the loading rack inside jobs, so they left out. And so if we want those kinds of things, we have to go where they are, Montgomery or Albany. Now we've got a first-rate grocery store down there, but we had more than one. Uh, we had two. Calhoun operated two stores here for a while. And then he concentrated on developing one. Uh, we've got a Piggly Wiggly, and uh, we've got a private, a privately owned business there, and then the Calhoun store down there. But uh, we do have a black, we have to have a black-owned bank, uh, First Tuskegee, uh, created out of the Tuskegee Federal Savings and Loan. Operation. I don't know. I don't know what our economic salvation is, but I don't know whether it's in that direction, farmlands and all. 
because you'd have to build community. You know, we had uh, years ago, uh, the Muslims uh, bought uh, farmland in Lauderdale County up in, Al up in north, northern part of Alabama. Uh, called themselves uh, creating the basis for a Muslim nation. Well, you see, uh, that's a figment of the imagination. You cannot create a nation. Uh, you can call a national group a nation if you want to. Uh, you know, you can call black folk a black nation if you want to, uh, but it's not, it's not a nation. Uh, it's not a state nation uh, because a state has to have three things and so far we can't produce but one of them. Well, maybe two, but a state has to have territory with fixed boundaries. You see, you, 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 if, if the state is here one day, you go back tomorrow, it ought to be there. Fixed boundaries. And it's got to have population. But the most important thing for a state, it has to have sovereignty. Sovereignty is this power to make laws, to enforce laws. Making laws, you can make laws to produce revenue, and you can enforce them. See? Uh, when Tuskegee, at one point, Tuskegee Institute had the great Artesian wells. Uh, supplying water for the campus and water for the surrounding black community. And Tuskegee would send these collectors out in the black neighborhoods getting this water, and they'd have difficulty. Black folk wouldn't pay the bills. And so what did Tuskegee do? It turned the system over to the city pipelines and all, and they pay the city. Because they don't pay the city, they cut that water off. But they, when folk, you see, uh, Tuskegee was t running a good public relations and all of this, you know, uh, trying to treat people fair, want them to support the school and all. And man, you had those customers out there. Uh, once or twice, uh, to my knowledge, collectors will run off the premises. They out there reading the meter and somebody shows up at the window like they got a gun and threaten them, you know? So, so, uh, Tuskegee, give it up. Tuskegee, look, Tuskegee, Tuskegee had a bank and somebody absconded with the money, some of the money. And Tuskegee then, under the President Patterson, gave the charter back to the state. And we got a federal savings and loan. We got a credit union, we got a federal savings and loan. And when, when we had difficulty over civil, with, with uh, uh, white racism here, they gerrymandered us out of the city, wanted to abolish the county and divided among five white counties, five, con five white controlled counties. And we tried to get from the state a banking charter. At the time, both banks were owned by whites. Now, of course, we got one, we got two banks, both of them, one is, has, uh, each one is operated by a black president. The Alabama Exchange Bank, the biggest bank in town, uh, was a white bank, it's now we, uh, one, of, uh, one of our local persons has been the president of it for years, black president. Uh, but uh, man, I tell you, we turned that, the, the president of the university at the time gave that charter back to the state, we couldn't get it. We tried to get it, say Tuskegee already has uh, enough banks. At the time we had the Citibank and the Alabama Exchange Bank. So the only thing we could guarantee was you could put your money in a savings and loan or in a credit union, but neither one of them had the authority uh, to issue check, I mean to, uh, to run checking accounts.
couldn't run checking accounts. So now we have Tuskegee Bank, Fresh Tuskegee. The guy who owns that uh, owns, a, owns a couple of branches in Montgomery also of Fresh Tuskegee. Dr. Tulman, it has yeah. been marvelous. I yeah, see man. why they said, don't leave town without talking <laughs> to Dr. Yeah. Blake Tolan. Yeah. And I know we only scratched the surface, but yeah. I appreciate and I'm grateful. Well, yeah, we've we, we, we roamed around pretty good. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, but it's a love of mine. History is a love of mine. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, and let, I, me, let me ask you. Uh, uh, my dream is to build uh, is to build a museum. Oh yeah. I, I really want to. I've yes. been doing this for thirty. Years. Okay. I've okay. I've accumulated about uh, twenty thousand hours. Woo. Okay. Okay. Had a chance to travel with our great historians all over Africa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Been to most of these demonstrations and most of these conferences and things with them. Mm-hmm. So what I wanted to do was to set up a world-class museum. That's, that's you, have I'm you given doing. yourself an idea of where you're going to put it? Well, that's what I'm looking for, and that's why I'm talking to you. Oh, um, okay. I mean, a world-class. I'm, I'm talking about something that sits on anywhere from five to ten acres of land. Okay. So you have to drive up <coughs> around the lake with mm-hmm. boats mm-hmm. and statues and suits to get yeah. to it. And then mm-hmm. it you know, it takes you through African history from the origin of man to the day. Yeah. You, you know, uh, you probably didn't get a chance to see it. Uh, we have uh, a painting outside the Martin Luther King Commons Room in the chapel. It's done by a black artist here. Uh, he does sculpture, he does metal in, 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 in indentations, metal, metal art, copper art. Uh, and he has done a silhouette painting that runs the entire length uh, back of the Martin Luther Commons room. And it is the journey of Christianity out of Africa is what he's dealing with. Yeah. It's right here? Yeah, in chapel in the Martin Luther King's Commons, outside the Commons. If you can get somebody to let you in the chapel, it's in silhouette of black. It's the journey of Christianity. You see, uh, North Africa became a center uh, of uh, Christianity. You had a bishopric of, of, uh, of Christians uh, at Alexandria in Egypt. Yeah. It's true. I, I mean, if, I'd known, if I'd known of your interest, I've got uh, a poster that I displayed here during a course we were doing uh, on uh, comparative religions. We just finished it. That's what our gathering was today. The graduation exercises for a course for the Senior Forum, Lifelong Learners Forum, uh, that we do. Uh, uh, Dr. Marbury and I wasn't, wasn't here, but we've done about six or seven of those courses. We did uh, one for a group and sent them to Egypt. We did one for a group and we accompanied them to Israel. Uh, and we, we've we done comparative religion. We've done the Gospels. We've done Book of Washington, and the women in his life, you know, do those things. I gave, on, on that little bow that I gave you there, I, I mentioned some of the things that I've done. Uh, research and lectures and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm the only university professor to lecture at the University of Benin in Togo and uh, and at the American Embassy in Togo yeah. and in Israel. I've lectured in Israel also. And I was scheduled to lecture in Greece and Turkey before September 11. Yeah. But uh, the group fell through. That, that project didn't come off. Yeah. I have a couple pieces I want to leave you. See, I feel like I'm trying to get them out of them. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, you, 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 you can take that mic off. Yeah, okay. You, said, um, you know, there, uh, 
we've got, uh, you, you know, you might want to talk with uh, persons. That, you know, we've got the uh, Book of Washington, not Book of Washington, we've got the Tuskegee uh, National Historic Sites here, you know, uh, the Carver Museum, uh, the Carver Museum, which was for the university.